Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Walter Poppy, your host of the Go to Market podcast, where we break down go to market strategies and tactics with founders, revenue operators, and investors to get actual insights to make your go to market plans faster and more predictable. Five, four, three, two, one. Zero. All engine running. Liftoff. All right, Mike, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, Walter. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'd like to start uh, from the, on your LinkedIn profile. You said that you, uh, it shows that you started at, cut, uh, at a uh, Cutco knife. What is a story from that time that has been a lesson for you in your career? <laughs> um, there's a lot. There's, there's definitely a lot. I think the overarching theme of what I picked up from Cutco is the ability to just push through, right? Whether it's cold calling into a phone book and hitting a lot of dead ends and having the bad days there, push through, find the next one that works. Uh, whether it's just having a day where you're not selling a lot, push through, it'll get better. You know, it's, uh, I think one of, I will tell you the worst day I've had on the job. And I've told this story elsewhere, but it's just kind of an everything can go wrong, will go wrong moment. I get in the car, I'm selling door to door and I get rear-ended. All right. So. First meeting's done, on my way to the second one. Don't sell anything meeting number one. Get rear-ended on the way to meeting number two. The cops come, miss meeting number two completely with like the cops and everything that are there. I have to call them, reschedule. Meeting number three, I go there, get bit by a dog. <laughs> so, out. I swear, I swear to God, you can't make this up. I get bit by a dog, so now my hand's bleeding. I come in, I'm like, all right, well, this lady's got to buy something. Her little chihuahua angry dog just bit me. And instead, as I leave the house, she does not buy anything and tells me about how it was my fault that I got bit by her dog. Like, that's her goodbye. Okay, so now I go into my beat-up car with a bloody cut hand and Band-Aids on. I'm like, well, on to meeting number four. Something's got to go right today. It doesn't. I go to meeting number four nothing's right. My mind's not into it. Just awful, awful day. I don't sell a single thing. And, you know, you wake up the next morning. It's like a Tuesday or Wednesday too. It's like the middle of the week. I still got a bunch to do. Wake up the next day and go out and, and kind of just literally reset. Ended up having a successful next day after that. So I think sales is, is a profession and I'm lucky that I learned it early on that no matter what you're doing, uh, the ability to push through those horrible times, uh, which will happen for everybody, is invaluable. No, absolutely. So, where do you think that mindset kind of where Like, how did that like come from? Is that something you just naturally always had, or is that something that you just developed over time? Yeah. So, I've always had a chip on my shoulder ever since I was younger uh, because I just want to win. I just want to be the absolute best. And it's for me, it's, I want to be better than myself. I want to be better than everybody else. Like I do. I know that that's not a reality, but in my mindset, when I go out to accomplish something, it's how can I get better than I was yesterday? And how does that get me towards being number one? And you can't really quit when you do that. Uh, I grew up playing sports too. And I think there's, there's some pretty, obviously moments in sports where you get pushed to your limit and you can't really quit or you can, and you're just, you're done, you're out. So it's like, do you want to keep doing this? You got to go through or you can quit and then you're done, but there's no really second chance in that. Um, I think for people who have had particularly difficult backgrounds and upbringings, I think that is sort of instilled in them through that as well. Right. It's like that path diverges and, um, uh, I read something and I forget the author. It might've been like one of the Naval's out there or not, but it's all about make the hard choice now. So your life becomes easier. And if you make the easy choice now, your life's going to be harder. And it's just, I saw it like a week ago. I don't think it's new, but it's stuck with me. So I think, you know, that drive, whether it comes from something internal, whether it comes from 
you know, a difficult sort of upbringing that you want to move yourself away from, or maybe you're just a driven individual, right? Maybe everything's gone well in your life and you're like, I'm just super driven. Great. Um, but I think that's kind of where, where I've seen it come from. And the people who I've met who have that as well, they've got that same type of pedigree too, where it's like this internal thing where they just click and they're always going to push themselves. Interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good observation. Well, kind of shifting here a little bit. Um, so you've done, uh, two, you've been at two companies that have, you led to help uh, acquisition. Uh, you're now at Child Care CRM. And through that process, you've had a lot of different experiences around go-to-market planning and those type of things. Uh, when you think about the strategy and how you approach that, what's your kind of high-level overview on how do you go about your go-to-market strategy? Yeah, so super timely uh, with everything that we've been working on. I think the first thing for me um, is alignment across the organization in terms of how you're going to hit your goals. So, you know, for anybody who's in sales, we talk about it, do the math and work your numbers backwards. Well, for a company, it's the same thing. You're just, it's bigger. And you have to start with a bigger number. So I think number one is aligning on the number for the company. So whether that's the EBITDA number, the bookings number, churn, net retention revenue numbers, you know, things even like ENPS, right? Your employee happiness scores, right? All those big numbers at the top. And you start aligning departments from that throughout your entire organization. Um, when you look into drilling down from that and going into thing like a, like a bookings number, okay, so from our bookings number, are we going to have only net new business? Do we have net new and upsell potential? Do we have net new and cross sell potential? Okay, let's cascade down. What are our percentages? Where are we getting it from? So, you know, when I think about the planning aspect of it first, it's like, let's do the math and cascade it down. And let's really drill into things. And let's go and figure out all the way down to, here's what each seller has to hit. And do we need to hire? Or are we over leveraged? Same thing with, uh, I would say from an alignment standpoint too, now you've got things like business development and you've got marketing departments. When you do your, your lead attribution, right? Where are leads coming in from? Where are we finding new business from? Okay, well, what number of bookings, not of MQLs, not of business development qualified leads, like what bookings number do we expect from these other channels? And then waterfall that down too. So I think for me, it starts out with that big alignment piece. And the number one aligning factor is, is revenue targets. So that's what I'd like to see too. When we get in our conversations as a leadership team, who's going to own what? but who's going to own what part of the revenue number? Like sales is going to close it all probably with the exception of maybe a partner deal that comes in if you've got that type of structure or a channel partner if you've got that type of structure too. But that all falls under the book. Stuff. So that's, that's how I really think about kind of kicking off the go-to-market motion and making sure that all those functional departments are really aligned around what's our end goal. No, that's great. Uh Let's focus in on as far as like the marketing business de development. When you're talking about uh, understanding the bookings number that they bring in, how do you kind of think about that or how do you approach that? Yeah. So if you've got historical data on where leads are coming from, that's awesome. Sometimes, you know, you're going to have to make assumptions. But what I think about is, let's say, you know, you're planning for 2021. Go look back at 2020. How many of your leads came from marketing inbound channels? How many leads came from your partners? of your partners, which leads came in uh, through the partner breakdown. You know, same thing with marketing, right? Your marketing channels, break down the marketing channels. Where did leads come in through? So I think starting there, if you have that historical data, understanding that, and then when you look at your growth targets, think about, okay, well, where can we really grow and where are we seeing growth? You know, if you see in the year 2020, your marketing was starting to drive more and more revenue as the year went on, well, you can expect further growth through that channel. And the more inbound you have, the less outbound you're going to do. So where's your seller bandwidth at? How are you chopping that up? Same with business development, 
right? How are you going to allocate to that? Have you seen certain partners form tighter and tighter relationships that then breed more and more closed business? Which partners close at a really high percentage? Which ones don't? So it goes back to, you can have a partner that tosses a bunch of leads over, but they're just bad leads that never really materialize. So when I think about that, I want to know, okay, based on last year, based on growth, based on our projections, we're going to see a 60% of our bookings come from marketing. We're going to see 30% of those bookings come from business development. And then we'll see 10% of them be seller generated leads. And you know, I think as companies get bigger too, that's where you start saying, okay, well, we want a sales outbound only team. We want a sales inbound only team. Now, how are we going to split those two up, right? But still you're, you're marketing your inbound lead would funnel into that sales inbound team. That's where those leads are coming from. Then you would just dedicate that 10%. Or if you've got a dedicated team, maybe you can do more. So I think when it comes down to sort of a specialization, how detailed do you want to go in that? And then how mature is your company will alter a little bit on what your splits are and how granular you get into really each department owning a number. And I use those three too, but there are others, you know, there could be a referral program that you guys have in place. I'd probably bundle that up underneath the seller generated. If it's true word of mouth referral, that's coming like I'm asking you in a selling motion Hey, do you have anyone else who would really like to use this? Like I'll roll that up under, uh, but there's also consultant agreements that are out there. There's channel partners that are out there that can get a booking number. That's not true. Like business development partner to partner. Um, so I think what, wherever your expected channels are, you have to consider breaking it out, whether that's three or maybe it's only two, you don't have any partners at the time, or could be, you know, multiple, uh, even more than that. No, that's good. <clears throat> as far as now within like just the sales motion of actually uh, closing the deals, uh, what are some of the things that you're thinking about from a tactical perspective that someone today could like start implementing to help them hit their numbers as they think about their go-to-market strategies? So we are huge on leading indicators. What's your activity? How much are you doing? Like, are you just doing the work? How many demos are you giving? What's your show to no show rate on those demos? And then when you're giving those demos, how many deals are going into quoted and one deals, right? So for us, we're looking at those motions right there. What are our percentages? What are our closing by channel? And how, what, what levers can we pull right there to increase bookings? Like what little changes can we make to increase our output? The other thing that we'll sit down and look at as well is, okay, from a seller motion and a seller standpoint, it's like, where are we losing deals at? And with that, what's our time in stage? Hmm. So how many activities? What's our time in stage? How can we shrink that as much as possible? And then because I've traditionally come from businesses that have gone from either selling one service to multiple or selling multiple service, it's what's our dual product penetration? What's our cross sell potential? And, you know, what's our average sale price? So some of those, and there's always little tiny details you'll find as you go search through the data and whatever numbers you want. But I think any organization right now, no matter what industry you're in, could look at those type of things and immediately find some triggers on where can we, where can we improve and how do we want to look at our seller performance? So the leading indicators will be different. That's ours. We generally have a really fast sales cycle in our SMB segment. So we don't, um, we don't need to look at, you know, meetings set per discovery, like you might in a long enterprise cycle or number of demos or, um, you know, really having from a forecasting standpoint, your seller drive, really when this deal is going to close the expectations you know, really long sales cycle, you need more of that involvement for our SMB stuff. We can get in there and know with some certainty uh, days that it'll close after a demo is done and, you know, those percentages as well. Right. No, absolutely. So once you find, have those leading indicators, how are you helping your managers uh, coach and develop your reps on how to improve those? So how do you coach the reps? You know, I think call listening is a great one get on here and see what's happening. Uh, for me, it all goes back to discovery. 
So I want to know, okay, you've got deals that are falling out after your demos. There's an issue going on with your demos. Let's look and watch your demos and see how they're going. Let's grade our demos. So as part of our new hiring, we do a demo cert and we have a rubric for that. So it's like, if we notice the demos aren't going well, let's dive back in. Let's listen to some demos and see where you're missing the mark. Generally, you know, if you're talking well and you're giving demos where you're confident on the phone, it means you're missing something in the value. So if I go in there and notice like, hey, you're just showing this feature. You're not actually guiding someone on a journey with you. You're not getting them involved. You're not talking to their pain. I know there's an issue with discovery. So now I can go back and listen to those other calls and be like, okay, we need to ask questions that fall in these four buckets that we know validate our product. If someone's got a problem closing, now again, like for me, this is just my thought process and methodology, like the close starts at the beginning too. But if someone has a really hard time asking people for money, which as sellers progress in their career, like you go from a BDR to a full cycle sales rep, like you're not gonna know how to ask people for money. It's gonna feel weird. Same thing. Like I remember in my career when I went from selling deals that had like no monthly fee because we were making credit card revenue on it all the way up to asking for people for $200,000. Like that was my jump. I was asking people for nothing to 200 grand. I was like, oh my God, I can't imagine this. Right. You know, like I'm asking people for more money than I'm making in a year right now. That's a crazy mind shift to make, but you, then you got to realize, okay, these businesses, they have this money. So I think in that regard, it's part of just understanding like, go ask them for the money. What's the worst thing that happens? They say, no, great. Right. But we have a company know that these price points work. So I think it's understanding the little nuances in each phase for each seller. There's no real blanket thing that you can go to, but it's listen to that. The next thing that I like to do is I am a stickler for specificity. Like if I go in and I ask you about a deal, okay. Hey, Walter, tell me about this deal. Right. And you go on this tangent that says, oh, well, we had a really good call and the demo was good. And I've got, you know, the next call set for this. If you're just talking about this was good or that was good, like I'm going to sit down and be like, why was it good? And if you can't tell me why it was good, then I'm going to be like, okay, so I don't feel good about this. So tell me what happened beforehand. Like, what did you do in this step? So in some ways, like it can come off kind of dickish. Um, and I totally know that. But in other ways, it's like, if you don't know this as a seller, you're setting yourself up to fail. And I want everyone around me to be able to like, I ask about an account, rattle off, boom, here's where they're struggling. Here's where we're going to help them. Here's how I'm going to show them that in the demo. And then once that's done, I'm going to have all this intel that I'm going to do. I'm going to get our follow-up items. I'm going to recap it in the email. And then when it comes time to close that deal, I'm going to tell them, hey, Walter, you told me that A, B, C, and D were really important to you right now. And I understand our price might be a little bit high for you. And you don't, you know, I've told people, you don't have to move forward with this if you don't want to. If we're out of your budget, that's fine. But are these three things really not worth this dollar amount to you? Because it was five days ago. And I'm using your words to close the deal, right? So I'll be training sellers who are having a difficult time in closing on using the buyer's words to close the deal. Right. And so I think that's my philosophy on training is go in, listen to it, understand the different skills and the different ways that you can, not in a dirty way either, but really help still drive this connection because time kills all deals. So you need to constantly be reminding your buyer what we're talking about, about what we're doing. And are we on this journey together, right? Has from the first moment that buyer said, we're in on this. And that's, again, why I'm a stickler for specificity in that regard. Because I want to know that my sellers know that it's a joint thing uh, throughout the process. So it's, it's those, and again, those like the things that I'm talking about here too, like those are the same leading indicator steps that we have that I was talking about beforehand. Right. So it all tees up on itself, right? And that goes back to the alignment piece, even within my department, I want to make sure that we're training to and developing skills that have continuity to the goals they're expected to hit that we know drive into closing new business. On that note, you mentioned about, hey, either my capacity is going to meet where I need to be at, or I need to uh, hire and basically recruit people. So when you're thinking about recruiting, hiring, uh, salespeople, how do you, what are like some of the things that you look for 
And what are some things that you know this is going to be someone who's going to be successful? Yeah. So I'm ahead of sales. So I'm always recruiting. I'm always trying to find people, keep them in my back pocket, know the networks, know what's going on. So for me, what do I see as far as people that I think will be successful? Um, man, it is hard. It's hard to hire sellers. So for me, I want somebody who's curious because it goes back to, are you going to ask good questions and are you going to care about the buyer? In that very first communication, are you going to ask them about what their day's like and how their business is running? And if they tell you that they're really good in one area, are you going to go and pivot the conversation to, oh, I have to shut down as a seller? Or are you going to now ask them questions that are like, well, how did you get there? How'd you do this good thing that really might make one part of our product not a good fit for you, but it might cascade into another, but now it doesn't sound dirty and you're learning as a buyer, right? So I need that. Um, I need someone who's tenacious and has a strong mind. You know, I told you kind of my story as we kick this thing off. I look for that. My favorite interview question that I ask everyone is, Tell me the worst day you've ever had working at any job. And then the follow-up to that is always, then what did you do after it in the next 24 to 48 hours? Because I want to know what, what's really bad for somebody. If you're new in sales, maybe you don't have that experience. But if I'm hiring from someone who's been in sales, like we have had some bad days. And I don't, you know what, if it's, hey, I went to the bar, I got, you know, overserved myself a little bit, but then I came in the next day and started hammering out phone calls again. I'm like, all right, fine. Listen, you're good. Some people I've had them respond. They're like, yeah, I went and ran six miles before the day was even done to reset. And then I came back in and made more calls. I said the biggest demo of the year right after that. I'm like, yes, that's what I'm talking about. Right. So it's that type of mentality. I love seeing people who come out, you know, again, I mentioned tenacious, right? Like you have to have that, you have to have that drive. Um, but for me with sellers too, nowadays, I'm, I'm so interested in the people who, from a selling standpoint, no technology. Because, and that's not to say I've sold technology before, I'm interested in knowing how people engage with technology, right? From a prospecting standpoint, our landscape is shifting. Hmm. Uh, people are buying more online. And, and so I think, you know, for me, having sellers who go out there who engage in these different platforms, especially in an interview when they can come and ask me, be like, so, you know, you, you run the sales department here, right? What are you guys doing to help your people prospect? What tools are you guys using? What do you have in place? Like, I love it when people can come and ask these questions of me that say, hey, I know what the landscape's like. I know what's out there. I know there's more noise than ever. What are you guys doing to cut through it, right? And, and I think that goes back to um, being curious a little bit. I love competitive people. I, I do. And like I said, for me, I'm competitive in a different way. Like I want to beat myself. I want to beat everybody else. I don't care about the beat everybody else. I need people who want to be better every day though. And that competitive drive is big for me. Um, I, there's so many criterias, right? But those ones are easy to see, right? Like the mindset stuff, the competitive, the curious, the tenacity, like that's easy to see. Now, you know, I think when you get down to like the technical selling skills, depending on the role you're hiring for, that can be a little bit harder. Um, you know, you got my friend, Amy Volus, who talks about the scorecards all the time. I have one of my own. Um, and and uh, it's... <laughs> hiring's hard. So I think everyone's got their criteria they're looking for too. You know, if I'm looking for a, a hunter, right? Someone to go out and just get net new business, they're going to have a little bit of a different selling profile than somebody who I've got, you know, what we would deem a farmer, right? Someone who's cross selling or upselling into our base. So I think part of that too, is understanding what profile do I want for this role? And to that same token too, like what stage is your company? In? Like, are you really established? And you can have a seller who comes in, fits this profile, boom, slot them in, you're good to go. Or are you at a smaller company where it's like, okay, well, I need someone who's going to go and get that business, but I also need them to be able to have maybe a difficult conversation with someone because onboarding is taking a little bit longer because we don't have the bandwidth right now. You know, I need someone who can come and step in and maybe, you know, wear a little bit of a marketing hat on the front end and go engage in those social platforms and be, you know, a brand advocate. 
which we're hearing so much more about and the success of that so much more. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking for all those things. And it's, it's definitely something that, you know, as, as a hiring manager, I write down, it's definitely something that I'm looking at and reflecting back on as well. Um, when I'm doing my interview motion. Mm -hmm. No, that's really good. You mentioned that the landscape is changing. What do you mean by that? So people are online more. Businesses are becoming more saturated and buyers are getting smarter. So when I think about where is sales moving to, where are we going in this life cycle is You've got the companies where you're selling into greenfield markets. So technology adoption, not really there. The service you're selling is novel in the space. And there's just not a whole lot of competition yet in that regard. Like, yes, you always need to build a strong community and a strong brand from a company standpoint. And there are many different ways you can do that whether that's from a company standpoint, whether it's individuals building that and doing it, posting on Facebook or LinkedIn or micro communities. I think all of the above is is the right way to do it. And we'll see that as the norm. But when you're in smaller ones, you need people who just get the word out, right? Because sometimes you don't know where your buyers are at right away. You got to go find them. So you need the sellers to lead that motion. When you get to these more established marketplaces, right? Like think about like MarTech or like B2B sales enablement. Oh my God, like getting into that right now, you're one of thousands of vendors. So in that regard, I'm thinking, okay, well, what does it look like in that segment? You need to have a really strong product. And I think that's where you start seeing this shift nowadays from a sales-led environment to a product-led environment. So you have to have a really strong product in those saturated markets. And from there, yeah, you've got to have really great content up front that then comes to the sales team. Now, there are some things that are never going to change. You need to get people's attention. You need to drive their interest. You need to add value to them. And as sellers, you have got to be just good question askers. And that's why some of those traits like curiosity, I said before, that will never die because people want to have a great experience with another person. It might be later in their buying cycle. And in something like MarTech, It is later. They've done 80% of their research already. Whereas when I'm selling childcare CRM and we go to our SMB segment, we're talking to people who might not even know what a CRM is. Huge difference in how you have to plan and how you have to go build your company around that. So I think when we talk about the future and you look into that regard, it's the relationship aspect is not going away. When you get to start having that relationship will shift I think companies and their employees will start playing a bigger role in getting a wider reach as far as involvement in the communities and getting their brand out and talking to the buyers. Um, And yeah, like micro communities are a huge thing right now. Uh, They're taking off. I've got kind of mixed opinions on how long they'll last post COVID when people get out and away from their communities. I don't think they're going away anytime soon, but in two to three years, it's going to change again. In five years, it's going to be way different. So where are we reaching people? How are we engaging with them? And the noise isn't going to slow down. So how can you break through it once, you know, well, whatever area you're in, right? Wherever your buyers are at, whatever that area is, it's going to get saturated. So mm-hmm. how do you break through the noise? How do you be, you know, provocative and pithy and grab that attention? Like those things don't change though. That's how it was 20 years ago. You know, when my dad was selling. Right. No, absolutely. So I'm just sitting here and listening to the way that you're framing your questions, the way that you're uh, thinking about different things. You're taking a step back and asking a question. Um, how did you create this like thought process of questionings and, and how to approach these different problems? So you say a problem, here's the question, here's a question I, I need to be able to answer here's the problem, question, question, question. How did you kind of create that curiosity or that framework to think of these questions? I think coaching discovery is one of the hardest things that you can do because there's no blueprint for the conversation because so many different things can happen and you can really go in any direction. So for me, I'm really passionate about training new hires and ongoing training on 
are buyers specifically? What are they measured on? What do they care about? What do they do in a day? What is their industry like? What are their struggles? What are they going through? So I try to get the team as knowledgeable as possible on who we're selling to. If you've got multiple personas, yeah, guess what? Break it out. Teach them each persona, right? right. More people, bigger sales, bigger dollar amount. Get a little bit better. Uh, and then it's about the industry, right? What's happening in the industry? What are the internal and external pressures that are going on? And then mapping out the buckets that we impact as a company. So when you talk about a CRM, lead generation and lead funneling to keep it all in one consistent place, right? So what are we doing on the front end to help you capture everything that you have in one place? Whether it's through partners of ours out there, uh, whether it's through just websites and landing pages that we create, whether it's through various different marketing campaigns and unique attribution that we can build in on the front end. Like, how are you guys doing that today? What does that look like for you as a company? And start wide, ask them, you know, what are you doing? to help bring new prospective families to your center. No, that's awesome. Right? That's really good. We're not, like we're, we're not a marketing agency. I'm not going to go market your stuff, but I want to know how they're coming in. And I want to know how you're tracking how they're coming in. And I want to know how are you reinvesting your money into that? And if you're doing a great job, what's working for you? So, you know, that's one bucket. We've got our others. I won't, you know, give you the whole childcare CRM discovery pitch right now. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but unless, unless you want it. Unless you want it. But I think it's about bucketing where we can impact somebody and then asking the questions that relate to that in their business, but also go a little off book from time to time. Like I said, one of my favorite things to do is if someone says, yeah, we're doing really good. Well, how? How are you doing it? Right now, we're not even selling. You're done. You're having a conversation now. And the things that you can find out by having that conversation, but, you know, someone can come back and say, you know, we actually don't really know how we're doing so well. Like, or something as simple as, well, all the centers around us closed and we decided to stay open. So we didn't do anything else other than budget our money the right way. Cool. You thinking of opening up another center? How are you going to do it? Right? So all of a sudden now your conversation is totally different, but we're still equally impactful just in a right. totally different way. So right. I, I will say this for... <laughs> If there's a sales leader out there who's figured out the code to teaching discovery, um, let me know. Give me a call because <laughs> it because it is hard. You know, I've read the gap sellings out there, the world too. They're great books. I think it's about understanding the questions you ask, but ultimately have the conversation, know your buckets, but get deep into it. And that's the meat. Get into it, right? If someone says, well, we've got no idea where our prospective families are coming from. You know, my next question for that would be, so how do you know how to spend your money? Or on the flip side, it could even be something like, have you looked at how much money you're wasting? Right? Those are really direct business questions. That's like, they're kind of a call out in some ways. So you have to build the rapport, right? You have to ask the questions. You're not going to dive right into that. But I think it's getting to those meat questions that right there. Now they're thinking, oh man, where am I spending my money at? And then, you know, now you can have that sort of that next level conversation. No, that's the really good. Drop down. I love it. Love it. Dropping the buckets. So, all right. So Mike, to kind of switch some things around. So on your LinkedIn profile, uh, you know, nine to five, you're helping uh, childcare and helping CRMs. Uh, you're nine to five. Is that how you position it? The five to nine? Uh, you're focusing on humanizing, uh, you know, humanizing sales. Kind of tell us more about what are you focusing on and what is it that you're doing? Yeah. So I got to give props to Alice, a company out there, Nina and her crew. I did totally rip that off from them. That little, uh, nine to five, five to nine thing. Cause I think it's just brilliant. So first props to Alice, uh, oh, Alice. they ran something like that. Yeah. Alice was great. Uh, the next thing I think when we talk about humanizing sales is earlier this year, you know, I noticed this theme. Everyone was talking about, oh, well, I did this great thing in sales and I did that great thing. And there's so many people coming up in sales and then COVID hits and you get, you know, a bunch of unemployment and people are hearing all these success stories out there. I'm like, well, why can't I do this? Or, 
this guy's automatically good. Like how would, did he get so good? Like there's just no context behind the journey to get to where really successful people have gotten, you know, again, like, so I'll go back to the story I told earlier, right? Like what if I had quit after the day that that dog bit my finger and I got rear ended and I didn't sell anything. I certainly wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Uh, but sales specifically is riddled with stories of failure of bad moments of wanting to quit for the people leaders out there. I guarantee you every people leader out there has had a missed conversation. They've had a bad employee and it's been their fault. You know, I think executives out there, you know, they have probably, and I, I haven't been involved in these, so I'm speaking a little bit out of step here, but I'm sure there's some CEOs and some CROs who have made bad people decisions, who have made mad structure decisions, who have made mad finance decisions on their path to, to where they are. So for me, humanizing sales, you know, it's, it's being able to be comfortable to talk about the path that got you where you're at. And that's not just saying, oh, here's this great shiny thing. And I've seen more people start to open up about that. Maybe it's always been that way. And now I'm just keyed into it. Maybe, you know, because of the struggle of 2020 that everybody's gone through, everybody's needed something to band night onto. And that's, and if that's the cause that comes out of this, we can have a more real conversation and I'll say, you know what, 2020, something good happened here, right? People are having a better conversation and I think the other thing too is, you know, back to, back to the fold earlier, right? So part of it goes to how we talk about ourselves as sellers, how we train ourselves as sellers, how we think about this profession in sales and being able to talk about the times that we failed, not like, Hey, celebrate me because I failed. It's like, no, this is what I learned from this moment so that you new seller or new manager or moving or experienced SMB seller moving into a mid market or an enterprise role so that you know that we're not perfect. And this takes time. You know, I always go back to sports because I know it well. Yeah, LeBron James was good from the moment he picked up a basketball. And he's one in a million. But there are a bunch of basketball players out there. And LeBron James works his ass off, right? So let's like not discredit that. But there are a lot of basketball players out there who are in the NBA, who didn't have a generational athletic skill set and mind to get him where he had to go. But even LeBron spends a million and a half dollars on training, right? So he talks about it too. Like he's not saying I'm, you know, the greatest gift to basketball ever and I don't do anything about it. Like LeBron or hate him, you know, he'll talk about his training and what he does, both mentally and physically. So I think as sellers, we need to talk about what we do, both mentally and skill set wise, and the missteps we've had along the way. And making sure that. When we do go out and sell and talk to our buyers, right? Those good questions, those curiosity about you, about your business, be a human, don't be a robot. Mm -hmm. Like in sales is going to get more automated on the front end. It will happen. AI is going to come in and do some crazy stuff. I'm really excited about it, but it's going to make that human connection even more important when that call happens. So I think for me, it's just about on the, on the two sides of the spectrum, right? Like let's call it out for what it is. Like we're not perfect everyone's made a mistake. Like, don't try to fake like you haven't, because that's not helping anybody. And to be honest with you, people don't want to work with people who they don't see any flaws with. Like they don't, they're like, I will never match up to this. It shuts people down. So by being a little bit vulnerable, and I'm not the most vulnerable person in the world, but I'll say, Hey, listen, I've had my missteps here and there, right? You don't have to dump or gush or anything like that, but acknowledge it. Right? <laughs> Listen, I've, I've done some, I've sent some very bad emails that I wish I could take back. It happens. I've learned from it. Now I'm better. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that's what it's really all about for me. Yeah. Being authentic, being real. I think, and I think it's also just not like removing this whole idea that everything's perfect. I, I completely agree with, with everything you're saying. So on that note, Mike, what's, what's been a failure professionally that you look back on that has had something that you've now implemented that has helped you in as a head of sales? So I'll go back to a time that I, that I stepped early into leadership and, you know, when I stepped in early, it was okay. Well, I got into leadership 
And I got here because I was good at sales. And here's why I was good. Right. And I laid out all these lists and I was like, okay, so I'll make sure that everybody else is good at these things. And if they're not, I'll try to make a bunch of little clones of me based on what works for me and my skill sets. Cause that's, I didn't have any training on how to be a leader. I didn't have any training on how to manage in business. Like you can motivate people and you can talk to people. That's great. But when it comes down to just tactical in the weeds leadership, it was, I'm going to clone myself. Well, as part of cloning myself, it's like you push on certain areas, right? That people just don't have. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, in one regard, it was like time management, right? And it was like, I forget. And I said something horrible. And I said it to like a group where it's like, if you guys can't manage your calendars, how's, how are you even going to sell? Like it wasn't, that wasn't the wording, but that's how it came across. And the intention was really good. The intention was as educational, but it wasn't. And I lost people on that team, like forever. Like people who were friends of mine, we don't even speak anymore. Like that's how bad it got. So mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about that. Like the learning lessons from that are people receive information in different ways. I am a demanding individual and I can remain that way as long as I communicate about what's important to me and that I will give back exactly what I expect. Like I expect a lot from the people in my life and the people who work for me, but I will give it back. So here, let's set the stage up front. I think understanding tailored coaching, right? Not everybody is the same. So tailored coaching. Uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier in terms of what levers, you know, people are working at, how you identify that. So doing that tailored coaching and something that I'm still working at today is softening up some of the communication. Like some people are really good at direct communication. That's what, I mean, I am, I'm very direct, but you can be direct, uh, but still soften up the message a little bit. So I'm still working on some of that stuff. You know, it's always still a process, but that, I think that for me, stepping into leadership early on was, there's no doubt about it, biggest gaffe that I made. And the funny thing is, is I've heard a lot of early leaders make that same mistake. So, hmm. uh, you know, another friend of mine, Derek Jankowski, he put on a summit for leadership and he works like that's what he does. He helps people uh, train them on how to be new leaders for the first time because we've got nothing there. It's a huge gap in the space. And that's where my mistake was. My, I would say to date in my career, my biggest one. Um, but that's the rebound from it, right? Is it's personalization. It's again, you're dealing with people. They're not clones of you. You can still be demanding as an individual but what you can't do is be imposing. Hmm. And I think demand certain things, demand certain behaviors, don't impose yourself on other people. Um, and maybe yeah. soften it up a little bit in my case. That's good. <laughs> good lessons. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good lessons. Um, so high achieving, you've done a lot of stuff professionally. What habits and processes have helped you get you where you're at? So I am a big fan of one scheduling out what you need to do. So for me, Sunday is my day. I'm going through everything. What do I have to do this week? What needs to get done? And then how am I going to go about doing that? You know, as an individual contributor, your entire world is okay. I'm cold calling. Here's where my education is. Here's where my training's at. Here's my one-on-ones with my manager. Here's the demos that I have set for the week. And here's how I can block out my activities, right? As you get up into leadership, some of that stuff's going to change. So for me, like I've got focused work for my super tactical stuff. All right, get down and dirty. You've got to do that. You know, I still to this day sell to some of our larger enterprise clients. So, okay, what part of my day am I going to do prospecting and getting out and doing that stuff? And then I've got the strategy stuff, right? So when can I have my thinking time? Can I step away? And what projects do I need to get done this week? What do I need to get done for the business? What do I need to get done for the team? So like right now, and I've got it right next to me, uh, I've got my to-do list in, what is it? Six different buckets, bookings, people, partners, enablement, company, and process. And on Sunday, I go through my list and I say, okay, here's my buckets. Now, what's the most important do I have to get done? I think that right there, 
Number one, most important thing for me in terms of keeping my productivity high. Uh, the other thing too is, is eliminating distractions. Like I don't know where my cell phone's at right now. My Slack is down. My email shut down because we're recording this. Same thing. Like if you're in a cold call motion as an individual contributor, shut it down and do it. Like if I need to have my thinking moments, shut it down so that I can think. Like you have to be able to separate and switch your mind on and off. And that's a skill that I gained that was really helpful for me. But the way that I did it was by shutting out all the other distractions. So I think that's been good. Just from a selling motion, um, from a thought motion, I'm really big on aggregate info, make a little decision, gather more info, make a decision. So for me, my process is constantly iterative where I will make a decision and I'm okay making that decision being wrong and changing, but I'm not okay not moving. So for me, that movement has helped me uh, along, but like to be clear too, it's like understanding what needs to get done in each one of those phases. So it's not haphazard, it's I've got enough to make a decision, go. Next step, go. Uh, and then, you know, I think one of the other things that has really helped me, and it's one of the biggest things that I've had to overcome this year is like, I like to experience things. That is so much of my life. So having that time outside of work to go experience things, go work out, take care of your body, go read a book, watch a show, take care of your mind. I have been absolutely horrible at that this year. Like, and I'll call it out. I'm saying I'm a better me when I'm out experiences in a city and going to the events and traveling and having these other experiences that I can bring into my job, but that also keep me away from my job. So I think having that release, whatever it is, you have to prioritize it. And I'm saying that as somebody who's done a really bad job at that, knowing, you know, when you hit the end of that rope, like it's tough. So I cannot tell and I can't really shed any light on how to prioritize that. My brother's much better at it than I am. I know there's people out there that are good at it. I am not, uh, but I would add that into the fold because I am a much better version of me when I do that. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Uh, you mentioned reading. What are you reading right now? So right now, one of the things, I got a new book. So I'm, I'm open. Uh, I've got a couple I haven't read. So, you know, I think one of the interesting ones is I love, uh, I love fantasy books. So I'm like halfway through the wheel of time series. Nice. So maybe I picked that up, uh, Brandon Sanderson. I haven't read any of his books, but I heard he's really good. So I might need to dip back into some Brandon Sanderson here shortly. Um, skin in the game, Nassim Taleb. I mentioned him earlier. So I've got that book I've been meaning to read as well. Uh, it's right on the county co coffee table, uh, over there. And, a handful of others. So I don't really know what I'm going to dip into next. Uh, I will tell you one of the books that, uh, one of the books that I did read earlier this year though, um, as well, sort of, I guess it wasn't, well, maybe it was earlier this year. I can't remember anymore, but you know, I led dare to read by Brene Brown earlier this year. And I think that's a good one. Um, uh, especially in light of, of the conversation around some of the mistakes that I made earlier in management. Like if you're in leadership or you're going into leadership, if you need to learn about how to soften up a little bit as I did. I mean, that's just a great book. Um, so I enjoyed that one and a um, handful of others. So I've, yeah. I've got a list. Anybody needs them, let me know. I'll send you some pictures. All right. Can't wait. Uh, last question. So Mike, <clears throat> what is something that you want listeners to take away from? A message that uh, after they get done listening to this, this is something that they can take with them. Uh, what is that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I think the number one thing for me as it relates to just sales, business, life is make sure that whatever you do, whatever's going on, however it happens, there are two things. Number one is your mindset. It is the number one skill that you can develop. And your mindset's a skill. It's not people are born with. You can develop a mindset. The number two thing is protect the most valuable resource there is, and that's time. Develop your mindset and own your time. And I think no matter what level of an organization you are at, if you can key in on those two things, and how to do those two things well, 
you will be successful. There's no doubt in my mind about it. Fantastic. Mike, thanks for the time. This was great. Yeah, Walter, thanks for having me on. I had a blast.